So. Cool. So welcome everyone to the info session for the summer school in computational uh, vision methods for ecology 2022, which will take place at Caltech in the summer, next summer. And Sara Biri, who is the main organizer, will now present to you the main ideas of the school, and then all questions are legal and welcome. Sara, you're muted. One second. I did that thing where, which is an, a recent thing, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but if you don't uncheck the share tab audio box, then you run into problems. Can you still hear me? Yeah, perfect. Cool. Okay, yeah, so what I was gonna say is um, uh, we put together just a couple slides just to kind of go through our vision, introduce the people who are leading the school and and then talk about sort of our plans. And then, yeah, we're very, very excited to answer any questions you might have. Um, and also this is a really great opportunity kind of early on for us to like hear about, you know, also like what concerns you might have with the school so we can really try to make it as, um, as awesome as possible. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I'll start with like some very brief introductions. Um, so I'm Sarah Beery. I'm a graduate student of Pietro's at Caltech. And um, I really came into graduate school from the beginning um, with the goal of becoming an expert in these computer vision methods so that I could apply them to problems in sustainability and conservation. Um, and I've really seen over the course of my PhD, both how much excitement and promise there is in this space and also um, how much more we all have to learn. And it's been really fun to see that community of people working at this intersection growing over the last you know, five years. And so we saw kind of an, an increasing need for something like this school, a way to try to bridge that knowledge gap between people who are computer vision experts who are very sort of familiar, not necessarily with building out um, like novel computer vision architectures, but just being very sort of good machine learning engineers, people who are able to work with existing code bases and train up models that are accurate and work well and build an intuition for how to do that effectively. Um, yeah, and so that's what we're hoping to do here. And Pietro and I have been working with the Resnick Sustainability Institute to, um, to set up this school and we're really excited to have our first session next summer. Um, Pietro, do you want to introduce yourself briefly? Uh, sure. Uh, Pietro Perona, professor of uh, computer vision at Caltech. And um, maybe Eli? I'm a uh, fifth year PhD student in the same group as Sarah, one of Pietro's students as well, uh, and also interested in uh, the relationship between kind of the challenging domain questions in remote sensing and in species classification, things like that, and what they tell us about things we need to improve in computer vision. And so it's kind of a, a pipeline that goes both ways in our lab where we look at hard ecology problems and we try to understand what our methodological shortcomings are that make them hard, as well as trying to apply computer vision back to these you know, specific problems and you know, hopefully make a difference. Um, Jason? Good morning, everybody. My name is Jason Parham. I'm a um, senior computer vision research engineer at a not-for-profit in Portland, Oregon. And we focus on animal ID um, pretty much the world over. So we focus on getting uh, ecologists the tools that they need to automate their workflows. Awesome. And um, Benny? Yes, morning, evening from Israel. I'm uh, Benjamin Kellenberger, Benny for short. I'm a postdoc at uh, uh, at the easier lab at EPFL in Switzerland over in Europe. And uh, I come from a remote sensing perspective. And in my PhD, I've been working on wildlife detection from aerial images using drones and so on. And these days, I'm dipping my toes more into the waters of ecology. So it's pretty much a similar context as what Sarah's been doing, but with the air, more focus on the aerial perspective. And then Patrick will be joining, I think, a bit later in the session, but um, Patrick's our final instructor and he's um, a student at Duke and he has some pretty awesome experience working with remote sensing data specifically for oceans and 
and looking at a lot of like these sort of larger scale problems in that space. Um, and then uh, just to briefly also introduce our amazing organization team, um, Caroline Murphy, Xenia and Sydney are, are sort of the, the engine in the background while you know our, the instructors are building out the coursework, um, they're, they're here basically to make sure all the logistics go smoothly. Um, so setting up room and board and um, like the application portals and all of that. Um, and we're super, super happy to have them. Um, yeah, so high level, the mission, like I mentioned earlier, is really that we want to teach applied computer vision as a tool for ecological research. Um, and the idea here is that we don't necessarily expect people coming to this school to leave um, as computer vision researchers. It's not the the goal is not that you know you're going to be um, trying to get a PhD in computer vision. It's really making it making the tools that exist that are actually quite effective already as accessible as possible. And so what that comes down to is trying to empower ecologists to really build their own computer vision based systems to solve their own ecological research problems. Um, we're also hoping to continue to grow this exciting sort of interdisciplinary computer vision for ecology community. And one of the cool parts about the school is that we've um, we've gotten a lot of resources, computational um, resources from industry partners. So there, each of the students will have um, a, a pretty significant amount of uh, GPU credits to be able to train up their models and test them and maybe even host them in the cloud. Um, so a couple of fun examples of uh, the types of work that all of us do. Um, uh, I'm probably most of my work has been in the, the camera trap space. So I work with Wildlife Insights is one example where we are trying to build a global scale species identification from camera trap data. Um, but we've also looked at beyond species ID counting um, and really exploring that space of like, how do you find the right trade-off between models that are generally useful for lots of teams of ecologists and models that are actually going to solve a single ecologist problems end to end. Um, so an, another example on that side is a recent project that we've been doing um, where we're doing long-term monitoring of a specific elephant population in the Mara ecosystem. And we have a deployed system that's leveraging both human intelligence and AI to make the humans as efficient as possible. Um, and it actually does that end-to-end -end problem solving where at the end they're actually getting out the species ID and the individual ID of each elephant as opposed to uh, just something like, is this, is this image empty? Like many other tools. Um, other fun examples are counting uh, trout in sonar data to try to, um, to manage sustainable fisheries or doing species identification in iNaturalist data. So that's like human captured images, as well as a lot of the stuff that, you know, people like Benny have been working on, um, which is doing censuses from aerial imagery. Um, and what we're hoping to teach in this school is uh, like a few different things. So, so one big one is just how do you actually frame an ecological research question as a computer vision problem? And, and how do you sort of get now, the, this reviewing relevant computer vision literature part, this is really coming from my experience going the other direction, which is really, it's just very important to know what keywords you need to search on Google Scholar to figure out what papers you should be reading. And that can be kind of a tricky translation issue. So um, we'll be doing these sort of mini reading groups throughout the school where um, where we, you know, each each group of people is being going to have, you know, an individual instructor that's working with them, and then that group will be working on similar types of questions. So maybe that's object detection or fine-grained species identification, and you'll go through and do like mini reading groups together. We'll also work on efficiently curating represent representative prototyping, like training and test sets. Um, and so what that means is, you know, maybe you have 20 terabytes of data. Well, you're probably not going to label all 20 terabytes of data. It'd be very expensive. And honestly, at some point, you usually start to hit kind of a, a barrier where you're not getting a lot more benefit from additional labels. And so understanding how to iteratively build up that labeled set of data from you know, some huge data set that doesn't have labels and how to, um, to do that efficiently and cost effectively is something that we want to work on. 
Um, and then also, I think probably the most important and the main focus of the school will be, you know, how do you actually use existing open source code bases to train baseline models on that data? And how do you use existing models and run them over your data and use that as part of maybe a component system? So for example, you know, how do you use something off the shelf like the Microsoft Mega Detector that is very good at finding animals and images? How do you use that as a component in a machine learning model that you're gonna develop that, that will actually help it, you know, maybe require less training data from, from your individual question? And then how do you evaluate models as they'll be used and how do you deploy them? Um, and so the way we're gonna be teaching is we'll probably start each day with a lecture um, and the lectures will be pretty hands-on. Um, we're, we're planning to build out some interactive coding and coding tools where basically we'll be talking through a specific concept or using a specific code base. And then we'll go through the process of all of us working together to test that out on some you know, toy problems. And then uh, the idea is that then later that day, you'll be able to sort of take that thing that you learned and apply it to your problem. Um, and there'll be lots of time for sort of independent work and also like direct mentorship from our team of computer vision experts. And we're also bringing on additional TAs um, who are, you know, other people who are maybe less far along in their computer vision careers, but are still super capable computer vision researchers who are just really excited about the school and want to be involved. And so they'll be around as well. So there'll be a ton of hands-on help during the time that you're here. And the goal is really that you'll leave with a prototype for your problem that you'll be able to actually use. Um, and then we'll also have keynotes from some pretty exciting researchers um, who are, you know, very well known in this space, either on the vision side or on the ecology side. Um, yeah, and our ideal participants when we were designing the school were, you know, sort of quantitative ecologists and conservationists, people who would actually want to be using the tools that they would build. Um, and the idea is that, um, that intrinsic motivation based around, you know, you having your own science question that you want to answer with computer vision um, and potentially even with data you collected, though we're completely open to people using uh, public data sets if they, you know, don't necessarily already have a data set collected for the question they want to look into. And there is some existing public data that would be a good starting point. Um, we are expecting people to have some familiarity with programming. Um, mostly that's just because if we were trying to teach people how to program in Python, that could take the entire three weeks and we really want this to be super productive. Um, but we are very willing to help, help people get there before the school. And we're actually going to be partnering with the Climate Change AI summer school that they're putting together, which is a little bit more of a um, designed not to teach ecologists to use these tools themselves, but more of like a teaming based, um, like a hackathon style school. Um, but we're going to be working with them to set up uh, kind of like a Python boot camp leading up to the school. So the people who are accepted or are, are, will basically have, you know, if needed, some hands-on guidance and in, in getting up to speed with Python so that they can be using the existing off-the-shelf tools. Um, yeah, and so we're asking people to put together an application that basically talks about their proposed project, what they'd want to be, what they'd want to be building while they were at the school talking about a personal statement, which is just, you know, what your career is, what you want to do, and what you've done so far, a CV and a letter of reference. And we're also asking for a programming example, um, mostly just to try to gauge where people are at currently, um, so that we understand basically like what that boot camp teaching process needs to be before the school starts. Um, and then we're optionally asking for a video if you want to sort of give a demo of, you know, talking about what you're interested in working on. And we put together a data form to try to get, uh, again, just more information on our end about what needs to happen before August so that we can really set everyone up for success. Um, yeah, so we would love to hear any questions that you guys have. Um, Pietro put in some some uh, fake questions here to kick us off if nobody has any off the front off the bat but um yeah please feel free um you can like raise your hand in the in the little thing if you want or if you want to just type your question in the chat then we can moderate them from there as well
I'll start off with a question, if you don't mind, Sarah. Yeah, Thank please. you for putting this together. It sounds so exciting. Um, I have a couple of different questions. I mean, one of my questions was around like the level of programming proficiency. Um, I'd probably class myself as like an entry level, maybe a little bit above that in, in R. So like using R to do data analysis, but not super proficient in like writing my own code. Um, so just kind of thinking along those lines um, and, and with this idea of a Python bootcamp, like would that be also like a really big step up to to do kind of like a I don't know how long the boot camp is planning to be, but just wondering kind of how you think that transition would be. Yeah, the boot camp is it's not really meant to be like a like a like an intensive like oh we're gonna do it for a week or something. It's more like starting from February or March when we uh, send out acceptances. Um, we'll probably have something like a weekly office hour, and then we'll have assign people tasks that are in Python. So basically, like write. Um, and there'll be tasks that are actually productive for um, the project that you're trying to put together. So data analysis in Python, um, and we'll provide some sample code and starting point, and then basically ideas. You can come and join an office hour with a bunch of people who are really happy to help you work through your bugs and help you learn it. Um, and I'm, I'm a big believer in learning by doing. Um, and I also, uh, I didn't know a lick of Python when I started my PhD. So um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, I, I don't want people to be deterred from trying to join the school by being like, oh, I don't know if I can get up to speed with the code. I think that if it's something that, if these are skills you want to have, then it's going to be really worthwhile to put in that time to learn. And I, we're, we're happy to try to provide the support to get you there. Okay. So ideally do a little, some background work yourself to learn the basics and then join this Python bootcamp to kind of yeah, get that to um, the stage. You don't, I mean, I don't even know if you have to get, like do background work ahead of time. It's basically like, you know, we'll, we'll kick it off and we'll be like, all right, like the first thing we're gonna have you guys try and do is do this, like plot some of data visualization in Python. Here's a collab to start with. And then you start from there and you try it out. And if you get stuck, you have people to ask for help and um, we'll just sort of work through it that way. Okay, great. And that would all be virtual, presuming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, just great. and like, you know, just drop in office hour style. Mm -hmm. So like if you if you're if you're working through it, everything seems good, then great. Um, otherwise, you know, drop in, ask questions. Um, and then also uh, one of the things that we're really excited to do is um, basically if you have data with labels all ready to go, you already have, you know, basically the plan of what you'd want to do and you want to just come and really just spend the time in person, like iterating on that, like really building your, your computer vision skills, then that I think will be a really productive way for you to do it. And you won't have so much sort of overhead work to do before the school starts. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have, for example, a large data set without labels, um, we're gonna assign each uh, accepted student to a mentor like right away. And that mentor is gonna help you basically go through the process of building up your own prototype data set so that when you start, you have your data in hand to work with. Because otherwise we could easily spend three weeks just getting a prototype data set right. together. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. I could um, ask people, <clears throat> people to turn their cameras on. It's much easier for us to talk to you if you can see you. Of course, if you're in a situation that is non, non uh, broadcastable, then of course don't turn it on. Um, so Hjalta, you asked, would you consider the school relevant for people that have already have experience with these methods from their research? Um, so, I mean, it depends on what you'd want to get out of it um, and what you mean by experience. If, if you already are someone who's, you know, is training computer vision models and, you know, uh, you want to basically really tune like your ability to do so and really like build up your expertise i still think that this could be a valuable experience for you because it's designed to be a little bit self-led in that like there will be these lectures but then there's also going to be a lot of work time and a lot of like individual mentorship and group mentorship from computer vision experts and so the idea is like look if you if you are at the point where you're already like training up basic CNNs and you want to just get a better handle on, you know, how you can actually push 
that forward and how you can get better results and, and how to or how to deploy them more effectively, I still think that um, it's hopefully going to be something that that would also be a valid um, way to join. Uh, and uh, yeah, I understand, you know, there's been so much interest that I like in computer vision recently that I think a lot of people have kind of taken those first steps and, and started training CNNs or, you know, turning off the shelf models. And so it's not that if you already have gotten to that point that there's that that this will just be re repetition. Um, and I think mostly that's because it's really designed to be something where you have a community and you're sort of building on those skills if you have them. Yeah, I would say, uh, Sarah, that <clears throat> one of our hidden agendas or our hidden agenda is to help foster a community and bring people together to come up, you know, to help forge a common culture. And so having a mix of people who have some of whom have done, have some experience already and some who don't may be quite optimal, in fact. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and I, I'd gotten one or two questions about, you know, whether it's possible to do just part of the school or do it remotely. Um, uh, but actually, for that reason, we're really trying to um, have the school be a little bit more like the Woods Hole summer schools or some of these other in-person summer schools, where like a good bit of the value is actually coming from the fact that you're joining a cohort, you're spending a good amount of time together, and you're all sort of iterating and working to build um, systems kind of in the same in the same vein. Um, and so the there actually really is, we think, a lot of value from the, the sort of doing it as a cohort. Um, so we're probably going to ask that people do sort of, if, if they want to be part of the school, at least this first year while we're trying it out, um, really like commit to showing up and being a part of it. Okay. Um, what question? Yeah. Any other questions? So maybe we can go around the room. Uh, Roni, do you have questions? Oh, I don't really have any questions. I think you've answered most of the questions I had. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Blair, do you have questions? I suppose since you asked. Um, most of, I'm kind of looking at like a methods-based approach, like trying to adapt AI for kind of like non-camera trapping, but more just museum specimens. Um, yeah. Is that something that would be okay Absolutely. in the setting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is not a camera trap summer school. <laughs> I don't even work on camera traps, though I do feel like I have this reputation of being like the camera trap girl. Um, but uh, but no, I we are very open to any type of ecological data. Um, and, you know, Eli and I and Benny as well have also worked on um, a little bit on methods that are incorporating, you know, multiple modalities of data or trying to, you know, add additional metadata into existing off the shelf um, systems. So stuff like, you know, a lot of existing camera trap or uh, existing uh, computer vision methods are sort of expecting, you know, single images, for example, um, but looking at audio or video or images in the context of where and when the image was captured. Um, those are all very much fair game, I think. Okay, more. Uh, Hannah? Uh, yeah, I mostly had questions um, regarding if it was an introductory course and you also kind of answered that, Sarah, so thank you. I, I don't think I have any more questions. Um, so I actually, I mean, if if anyone is willing to say, um, do any of you kind of have an idea in your mind? You know, Blair mentioned um, museum specimens, but uh, do any of you, uh, the rest of you, have sort of an idea of what type of uh, you know system you'd want to build? Like, what what are the actual um, what are the applications you guys are interested in? Just to break the symmetry and go around and call names again. Uh, so Melanie, you're on the top left on my screen, is that for me? Yes. Um, well, I, I'm working with a group on individual ID of, of grizzly bears. Um, we've been kind of working on this for a couple of years now, um, but I'm kind of like the ecologist on the project. Um, so learning bits about computer vision as I go, but I'm not responsible for any of the actual work in terms of the development side of things. 
So um, I thought that this could be like an ideal opportunity to start to learn a bit more about how to get more involved in that side of things myself. Um, so kind of know a bit about the, the theoretical side of, of computer vision, but haven't actually got my hands on working with the data at all. Um, so our data is um, we have photos taken with like handheld cameras, but then now we also have a fairly good sized camera trap video data set that we're just kind of pulling together now. Um, so that's probably what I would want to work on for this. We've got kind of like four years worth of data uh, from one site of, of pre-identified individuals. So this is like a long-term monitoring site. So it kind of provides an ideal opportunity to, to start to look to training some models for, uh, for individual ID and maybe even like sex, sex class and age class as well. That's something that I'm really interested in. Um, so yeah, so that's, I think, what I would be wanting to, uh, to look at developing. Uh -huh. And uh, <clears throat> Sarah, while you were presenting, somebody called in, <clears throat> that was Jess Atkins, with a question from a friend of his, which was, um, are we interested also in using satellite imagery to detect and classify the species of trees for the purpose of carbon capture? Is that something <laughs> you're interested in? <laughs> well, I'm currently uh, looking at that specifically in my own research. Um, it's a pretty tricky problem, but yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, if that's something people are interested in, I think that's absolutely fair game. And I uh, both Benny and Patrick um, have a good amount of experience and Eli actually, and much to much lesser extent myself, a good ex amount of experience with working on satellite data. Okay, so that's an answer to that question. So I'm adding questions to the FAQ in the presentation. So if you want to exit Perfect. and get back again, it's, uh, you will find them. Okay, let's keep going okay. in the room. Uh, Felix, Rostemeyer. Uh, yes, uh, currently I'm working on uh, permafrost identification using satellite images, uh, cool. especially looking at the um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from permafrost, foreign permafrost. Uh, and I might want to uh, develop this further or look at the different soil carbon uh, emissions. Uh, there are other nature reserves in the world that also emit uh, a lot of uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, and now currently I'm using satellite imagery to detect uh, permafrost, but I you can do this as well for other sites around the world. Uh, so I might want to continue further with permafrost or look at, at, at different um, sites. Okay, that's awesome. great. And when you guys speak, um, if you want to say your institution that helps us get a, a mental picture of where people are. Um, uh, where they come from. Now I'm currently doing an uh, internship at the Stockholm Environment uh, Institute uh, in you. Sweden. Thank you. Awesome. And I'm going to the bottom right of my screen, Ethan Spafron. Uh, hi, I'm uh, up at University of Montana, and we're really interested in looking at woodland draw habitats in the Northern Great Plains. So um, these are like areas with a lot of woody cover in mostly grasslands, and they're super important for like songbirds and um, large mammals and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, so yeah, we're looking at different ways of uh, pulling those out using satellite imagery. Um, we're kind of interested in like both the segmentation component and then also the kind of object detection and classification of these because uh, we're also like in the process of kind of developing a taxonomy for like different woodland draws because Nobody has really done that. So um, yeah, that's kind of what we're doing right now. OK, that's great. Thank you, Ethan. And now I'll take a bottom center of my screen, Alan Ma. I don't know if people have the same order on their screen. Even. Alan Ma, tell us about your interests. I can see Alan nodding, but I cannot hear his voice. He's uh, muted. Is nothing again. Okay, so maybe we'll uh, move on to just above Alan. There is Christian John. Hi there. Uh, I am Christian and I'm at UC Davis. Um, I'm working on a project I put out 
like 135 time-lapse cameras all over the Sierra Nevada mountains. And I'm trying to um, like monitor vegetation, like green up timing and snow melt timing um, with that. And there's one particular part of that that I think would be really like, that kind of got me interested in this class and that is flower identification. I'd like to try to count all the flowers in my pictures. Um, which I know is like a pretty classic machine learning problem, um, but one that I haven't really taken the time to teach myself how to do quite yet. Um, so. Right. so one question. <clears throat> so, uh, Christian, you give me the opportunity of making one comment. So one question I often, so it's fascinating to count flowers and to count zebras and so on. And so one question we always debate is whether we are just doing pretty stamp collections, or we are serving a, a long-term <laughs> goal that is worthwhile? And uh, you know what is the ultimate impact? And I'm not asking people to justify what they do right now, but this is something that I will be asking people in the school. You know, what is the ultimate, like, you know, a test that is very important is, let's suppose that you are widely successful in your application. You know, in what way will the rest of the world benefit? And uh, it could just be, <clears throat> it could be science, which is great. It could be conservation and so on. Uh, but, <clears throat> you know, what, what is uh, the effect on the rest of the world? It's important to think about it a little bit. Okay, I'll take another. By the way, um, Xenia, what are you introduced to, to everybody? So Xenia is... Um, okay, why don't you introduce yourself, Xenia? Oh, hi. Hi, guys. Um, uh, my name is Ksenia Masha Kelly. i here representing the Resnick Institute. So we are very excited to support the school this summer and looking forward to people, you know, uh, joining us at Caltech and Pasadena um, over the summer. Uh, and uh, we're here to support you. So I'm, I'm, I'm a chemist by training. So this is kind of a new um, area for me, but it's, it's, it's great. It's really exciting. And hearing this discussion is really, is really informative. So thank you. Thanks. Wonderful. So sorry, Xenia, I mispronounced your name. Oh, don't worry about it. It's, <laughs> you're not the first one and you're not the last one. It's I, all right. <laughs> cool, so I shouldn't pronounce your name. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay, uh, Mitch. Uh, Hey everyone. Um, yeah, this sounds awesome. Thanks for putting this together to all the, the team doing it. Um, I'm a grad student at University of British Columbia up in Vancouver in Canada. Um, and I work in a camera trap lab where we kind of look at the interactions between wildlife and humans and how they coexist. Um, and what I'm looking to do is create kind of the, or work on a kind of classic species classification model. Um, particularly hopefully across a lot of different projects in kind of Southwest British Columbia, where we have um, quite a few years of data that we've been manually classifying and are now getting into using mega detector to do some um, object detection to speed that up a bit, um, but hopefully to speed it up even more and make it a little bit easier. Right, awesome. great. So I, I got a text message from Alan Ma whom I had asked earlier to tell us his uh, interest, but he's in high school and he's in the middle of a school, so he cannot <laughs> turn his microphone on. <laughs> okay, so anyway, you're welcome, Alan, to be with us. Uh, Roni, do you want to tell us your interests? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm actually postdoc at John Gadiri's lab in Caltech, and I'm currently working on um, re uh, a regression problem where I'm collecting videos of drone of uh, tr trees swaying in the wind using drones and I'm trying to estimate wind speeds. Now I'm currently I'm okay like the results I'm getting are okay um, at a specific site but my main goal is to try and generalize it and a general um, application or the most um, immediate application that this could be useful for is uh Forest fires, for example, um, when they happen, uh, firemen need to know where the winds are the strongest and where they're heading. And pulling a drone up into the sky and getting a complete aerial view and a complete map of the wind speeds would be much more beneficial than installing single point anemometers all over the forest. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Cecily, if that's a pronunciation. 
Yeah, <laughs> it's Cecilia. Um, yeah. I'm from Aarhus University in Denmark. Um, so I'm actually starting my PhD the 1st of January next year. And I am going to look at insects. Um, and my main goal is to investigate how we can um, estimate the biomass from pictures of these um, insects. So, yeah, I don't know a lot about the project yet, but I'm really looking forward to to get to know more and, yeah, uh, come in terms with computer vision. So, wonderful. Yeah. So let's see. Well, I guess Blair hasn't told us yet. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm a second year PhD student at the University of New Mexico. Um, I'm actually a geographer, uh, but I'm looking at um, 3D modeling of museum specimens, and then I'm trying to do some AI with that to help in the field detections, identifications. So again, you would scan, you would scan uh, anim uh, basically taxidermized animals in museums, and you would want to classify them. And um, so we were contacted maybe five years ago by the entomology museum in Berkeley. And they have, I think, 3 million insects uh, that they wanted to classify. <laughs> is that your, your thing or you're working at macrofauna or what is it? Yeah, so I was actually looking at uh, macro invertebrates. So in the aquatic setting. So not 3,000 of them though, so. <laughs> okay, great. Um, and Helte, have you told us already or not? I've lost track because I've got, been jumping around now. I heard it wasn't very interesting, I guess, uh, if you already knew. No, I haven't told you anything yet. Please. Uh, I'm a PhD student at uh, Aarhus University in Denmark, actually in the same uh, group as uh, Cecilia, uh, who will start her PhD in uh, soon. Um, and I work with uh, using uh, these methods that you uh, uh, having a summer school in computer vision and uh, deep learning for um, mostly for tracking uh, biotic interactions uh, between insects and flowers, so mostly pollinators. And the idea is to uh, use um, this as a tool for monitoring uh, nature in remote locations. So mainly I work with the data from uh, many different sites in the Arctic. What does the data look like for you if it's insects and flowers? Is it like a very sort of specific data collection setup? Yeah, so so I have different sets, but my main set and my largest data set is uh, images from time-lapse cameras, near-surface time-lapse cameras, we call them. So they are mounted maybe 60 centimeters above ground and they they uh, focus. Yeah, so uh, Christian is uh, giving me a thumbs up. So. Uh, I gave him a, a virtual thumbs up before when I heard his, uh, his uh, idea. So I actually do exactly that. So I count uh, flowers and insects to monitor uh, phenology and to see if there is a mismatch between uh, uh, the two groups and how climate change uh, is um, influencing. So that's actually, both of those are super exciting for me as well, because one of the things I've been really interested in lately is, you know, I work with Wildlife Insights, which is, you know, camera traps all over the world. We have over 20 million images, I think now. Um, and it's, you know, most camera trap studies are very wildlife focused, but there's so much information in the in the background in terms of plants. And so I've been very interested in trying to figure out what's sort of the quickest way that we can get to like good vegetation models across, you know, the globe from those uh, those camera trap images. Specifically, it's it's just so cool that you get so much information over time, you know? Anyway, so great. Yeah, I'm I mean, we have more than 20 million images uh, from just our site, so uh, you are very welcome to uh, to help out. <laughs> <in time>. so, <laughs> I think I'm in the school just uh, because of that. That sounds like a challenge, huh? So <laughs> I would say, uh, Sara. So what uh, this conversation gives me lots of ideas, and so one thing is when we have our list of um, of participants, which will happen in February or March. We should have a website where people start posting what they do and what data sets they use and so on. So, so everybody gets to look at each other's work and we get a little bit of pre-front-loading somehow of, uh, of expectations and, um, 
questions, ideas for the for the project. Okay. Yeah, I think we'll add, we'll probably add like a, a cohort page to our web page and everyone can put a bio and you know what they're working on. Um, and then, yeah, we're, we're hoping, and I think this will be very much true that uh, there'll be a lot of sort of symbiosis between certain sets of projects. And so um, hopefully there'll be a lot of opportunity for people who are working on close-ish types of things to be sharing resources, data, code. Um, so message to the to the Danes. Uh, I know that Orhos is not exactly around the corner from, from Copenhagen, but um, our collaborator Serge Belangi, who used to be a Cornell tech, is opening a new lab in of, on AI in Copenhagen. And one of the pillars of the lab will be applications to ecology. He will be coming to the school, but if you want to reach out to him ahead of time, um, and I think that his vacation home is across, you know, it's not far from uh, Orvus, so you can maybe be able to invite him for to give a talk. Um, and so let me type here uh, the name, Serge Belongi. It's like, it's called the Pioneer Center for AI, but potentially you've heard about it already. But I think Ar maybe Orvus is actually one of the universities that's, because it's like a, a joint center across a bunch of universities in Denmark. Anyway, I think it sounds really cool. And Serge is amazing. He's done a bunch of really awesome work, especially in the, the fine grained recognition space, which is something you run into a lot, right? In, in ecology where you have species that look very similar and are in fact very different and species that look very different and are in fact very similar. <laughs> so the people who are trying to identify flowers and um, also the, um, they're the taxidermized animal or the preserved animals, uh, if you want to try iNaturalist, let us know how it works for you. That would be very interesting because um, we've been working with them. And uh, uh, Grant Van Horn, who was our student here, um, working on these topics for Sarah, built the computer vision system and the uh, statistical backend for iNaturalist. Uh, and we are still working with that crowd. So knowing how the system works for you would be useful and so that would be one thing that probably we'll learn about when you come to the school yeah it's i think it's actually probably an interesting like data type generalization question is like if something is trained to recognize flowers and insects in images mostly taken from people's cell phones um does that generalize at all to you know whatever your sort of specific time lapse setup is and how can we I mean, if it does help a bit, like what's the most efficient way then to to take the iNaturalist model and adapt it for your specific class set and like the specific data collection type that you're using? So yeah. I use iNaturalist on my phone. <laughs> and, um, I use it a lot because I, I simply enjoy uh, using it, not because I have particularly interesting things to do with it. I'm told that um, there is an API. I've never tried it. Uh, but it should be documented online. And so if you have a million pictures to upload and, and try out, I think it's possible. I would start with a thousand, not a million, but anyway. <clears throat> I mean, I just use it to tell me what flowers are when I go hiking, but yeah. <laughs> to each his own. It's pretty cool. great. I like that it's offline. It's nice. Wondering if anyway, um, cool. So uh, does anyone have any other questions after after this discussion? I'm getting more and more excited. I I think this is going to be really fun. I'm wondering if <laughs> based on I mean, and um, uh, who else is here? I guess Xenia, Sydney, Caroline, if they have questions to the prospective participants that they're curious about. I, I think we're just here to support this effort in, in and, and guys, please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, I know we already had an issue with Zoom, um, <laughs> but we move forward, which is great. Um, so that can happen, but anyway, but if you have any questions, we're here to help out with any kind of, um, you know, issues. Carolyn or Sydney? Yeah, no, I just say, if you, have, yeah, if you have the same thing, reach out if you have questions, we're gonna be, um, posting the application soon, which is done through like a Google form and a Dropbox combination. So, and we just created it. So if you have any issues with uploading, the CV for ecology goes to all the um, 
email goes to all the organizers and we'll address it. So just reach out if you have any technical problems yeah. with any of that. Expect a few a few kinks here and there and be vocal uh, about it. Um, we are fixing things as we go. And uh, yeah, and also if anyone up. has not even just content questions, like logistical questions about the school. Um, yeah, I can just high level um, before we sign off. Um, yeah, so room and board is is going to be at dorms at Caltech. There'll be private rooms, but you know, Caltech dorms. Um, and uh, the attendant attendees coming to the school will be responsible for their travel and there's a registration fee, but that's sort of the only sort of responsibility that you guys would have um, financially for coming if you're accepted. Um, I do think that uh, in case that the registration fee and the, um, the travel, if that is an issue for you or your lab, then please reach out. Um, I've been working with a, a couple different companies to try to set up travel bursaries for, for anyone who um, isn't able to support that, the travel costs. Um, so yeah, those, are, those will be, there will hopefully be a couple available. And so, you know, please don't let that be a deterrent for up applying. Um, and I actually already did post the application form this morning, um, so please, uh, it's up now on the webpage. Take a look at it. Um, we tried to come up with something that would hopefully allow stuff to be reasonably organized, but you know it's our first time doing it. So if anything is just crazy, please let us know, and um, we'll that'll give us some time to fix anything before the deadline. Um, yeah, just just to add that, like the little logistical things, we'll we'll also try to put them all together in, in the same, you know, spot on the website. So if anybody has any questions, um, you should be able to find it there. But if you, you don't find something, then let us know. Um, as Sarah mentioned, you know, the accommodations are at Caltech dorms and there's any dorm, you know, you would have to bring your own, um, you know, sheets uh, because that's sort of standard. Um, so that's kind of thing that, you know, when you pack, make sure you have that <laughs> stuff with you because it would not be available. Um, otherwise, so anyway, but you know, we can, we can help out with a lot of, a lot of that stuff and provide all that information as when the time comes. And um, so, yeah. Oh, and the other super exciting thing that I forgot to mention is that I'm putting together field trips for the school. So there'll be two different sessions during the time where we're actually gonna go out locally in Southern California and visit um, existing deployed computer vision for ecology um, sort of stuff, which I think will be really fun. So there'll be a couple different times that we'll actually be sort of going as a cohort and going outside and checking out different ways that people are using this stuff in, uh, in Southern California. Awesome, okay, uh, I think we're almost at time. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining your questions and, and also just telling us about some of your interests. I'm really looking forward to seeing everyone's applications and yeah, please reach out if you have any other questions in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks. you. Thank, thank you. you, bye. Bye. Good seeing you all.